hello everyone welcome back to event insights um, my name is Chrissy Lundy. I'm head of content and community with Safe Events. And joining us today, we have Kat Kevern. So Kat has almost a decade experience working in the global events industry. She is the chair of NAWI, which is the network of women in events. And recently, she also launched her own company, Electric Cat Productions. So absolutely positive that she is the best woman to talk to us about freelancing, which is the topic today. Um, if we could ask, if you have questions, just either pop them in the Q&A only section of the chat or wait till the end because Kat is very happy to do a Q&A section at the end. And of course, to let everyone know, as usual, this is going to be recorded. Um, we will be posting it live on our YouTube page this Friday. So in the meantime, Kat, I'll let you take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. And yeah, I'm really excited to share some insights today. So I'm going to jump straight in and share my screen. So the topic of today's session is to freelance or not to freelance, uh, something that comes up a lot in the events industry as it is an industry that's very heavily reliant on self-employed staff. So I'm going to jump straight in. Um, so today's session, I'm going to cover a couple of different points around is freelancing definitely for you, uh, starting your freelance career and making it work in the long term. So I'm going to be giving away lots of really good tips and tricks um, to those of you who are maybe considering going freelance, who potentially have just started, or even those who've been doing it for a while. Um, and yeah, um, so very quickly about myself. Um, as you mentioned in the introduction, um, I started freelancing in 2015, uh, so just under a decade ago now. I started, I grew up in Paris, so well, I grew up in France and then moved to Paris when I was 18 and fell into working at club nights, doing promo, doing a little bit of artist liaison, translating emails and sort of anything that needed to be done. And I was so passionate about it, really, really enjoyed it when, um, yeah, I enjoyed it a lot more than the law career that I was uh, set out to start. But um, yeah, did a very quick 360. And then in 2016, I decided to go back to university once again for a second attempt and decided to study something that was a lot more my bag. Uh, so I went and did events management and marketing. Um, I graduated in 2019 and uh, got involved with NAWI, the Network of Women in Events, uh, in 2021. I was very fortunate to be appointed as chair, uh, which I'll touch upon a little bit more later. Um, and last year, I started my own business, as you mentioned. So, um, yeah, Electric Cat Productions, we're a marketing and events organization. We specialize in B2B marketing for events companies. And we also do, uh, we produce events as well. So that's a very brief introduction about myself. Here are just a couple of photos. I thought it'd be nice to just give a bit of context and show some of the epic events that I've been involved in over the last few years. So um, from uh, a festival in Croatia, Outlook of Dimensions, to um, one in Costa Rica. I think this was at a ski event. I've done some a little bit of touring briefly as well. Um, this one, you might be wondering what the hell that is. That is the Operation London Bridge. That was um, the funeral, the royal uh, funeral that took place last year. Um, uh, yeah, I've also done a lot of um, very varied positions, roles, events. I try. I've tried very hard to say yes to every opportunity I can, make the most, learn new things, and. Um, have yeah, definitely embraced the variety in the roles and the events and have always tried to do as many abroad as I can because I love to travel as well. So um, yeah, that's a little bit about me in a nutshell. Uh, my favorite topic to talk about is NAWI. Uh, I'm very, very passionate about the Network of Women Events. So it's a non-profit organization. Everything we do is driven by the community and it's for the community. So we want to make it as accessible uh, as possible to our members and we have uh, our three pillars which are networking job opportunities and increasing representation so everything we do tries to come within those pillars we do networking events we have uh, known to be a mentorship program that um, some of you might be aware of already if you're not and you don't know now we get involved it's free it's um, a really beautiful wonderful 
inspiring community to be part of um and yeah the, there's so much going on so uh, stay tuned we actually have a big announcement coming uh, tomorrow as well so um sign up to the newsletter if you haven't already and um yeah take a look so first of all uh, just to understand a little bit um where people are at so today i'm going to be talking about freelancing whether it's worth it what it's what it entails whether it's um a good choice whether it's for you but um yeah i'd just be interested to see in the comments uh, if anyone would like to yeah let me know are you already freelancing are you thinking of freelancing are you juggling freelancing and employment are you um yeah where is everyone at it'll just be really interesting to um yeah see where everyone's at in their journey so as we're starting with questions uh, i think it's always um really interesting to ask questions to yourself so is freelancing really for me? Um, what are my current commitments, whether that's financial, whether that's personal? Can I live with the uncertainty? Uh, do I have the right and big enough client base? Um, am I prepared to put in the work? Uh, am I doing it for the right reasons? So these are all really important questions. I sort of fell into freelancing because I was at uni. It worked really well because over the summer, um, I could just work at events and then didn't have the commitment of a all year round job. I also live uh, sort of in between Cambridge and Bedford where there aren't, uh, a, a, you know, the kind of numbers of event agencies and companies as there are in London or maybe Manchester or bigger towns. So for me, it, it happened very naturally. And um, whilst I was at uni, it was a four year course. So I always went and did the same events year on year. And then when I got my degree, I just remember thinking, well, I just don't think I would want to not go back to those events and do them year on year. So that's when I really thought, well, for me, freelancing seems to be a great option. Um, I was very fortunate when I started out my career that I was living with family. So I didn't have the kind of financial burden of a mortgage. I, I didn't have kids. I didn't have commitment. So for me, it worked really well. I was able to take the financial hit that it cost me to get the experience because yeah I started out doing a lot of volunteering a lot of shadowing saying yes to everything so that I could take that as a learning opportunity um so yeah I kind of just fell into it really um interestingly enough my first ever freelance opportunity I, I didn't actually I, I wasn't even registered as self-employed so I definitely did don't recommend doing it the way I did um because it was actually yeah not not by the books I didn't think to ask they didn't think to ask me I just said yes to an opportunity and they said at the end send me an invoice and I sort of had to google uh I just remember going what what's an invoice how do I fill it out what what, what does that mean and then once I'd sent it to them I then realized that I wasn't registered as self-employed so very quickly I went onto the gov website um set myself up got my UTR number and uh from there the rest is history but um yeah, something I always like to point out and sort of discuss when having the conversations about whether freelancing is the right opportunity is around a client base. Um, this is probably one of the biggest challenges that I started out with because I didn't have a big client base. I didn't have a network. I didn't know enough of the right people. So my first two years, I really, I didn't, I wasn't getting the right kind of opportunities. I wasn't doing enough of the right kind of roles and it it really was challenging it was extremely challenging I, I worked when I was at uni my very first year I also worked at Weatherspoons um in a local uh, branch so I did a little bit of pub work as well to support myself because I definitely wasn't making enough money um through freelancing to support myself so I always had that and then through Weatherspoons thank god that um that was only a brief stint um, and then I met a really good friend who went to work in other pubs near me so um I did that for for quite a long time probably the first two three years and then yeah have always yeah done whatever it took to to mean that I was available to say yes when those um freelance opportunities came up um also I think a question that will probably resonate a lot well hopefully is am I doing it for the right reasons so this is something that I always speak about as well is 
I think a lot of people, the common conception can be not having a boss. Um, I always say when someone says to me, I want to go freelance so that I don't have a boss. I say you don't have a boss. You have as many managers or bosses as the number of clients that you have. So if you have 10 clients, you then have 10 bosses. So I think there's sometimes a little bit of misconception uh, around the freedom that is associated with freelancing. So that's something I'll touch upon a little bit later. Um, but yeah, these are all a, a bunch of questions that I would say, take a picture or make some notes um, and have a think about what is it that's really motivating you to want to go freelance. So this is something that I love to speak about, which I came across a couple of years ago. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar, but with the Japanese language, I love it. They have so many words. Uh, being um, a little bit of a linguist, I always find it really interesting to understand languages, structure, how things come about. And in Japan, they have words for so many amazing things. So one of the concepts, if you aren't already familiar, is ikigai. So it, it literally translates to your reason for being, sort of your raison d'être. Um, so I really love this diagram because I think it explains it really well. It's a combination of doing what you love, what the world needs, what you can be paid for, and what you're good at. So it, it can be tough, especially at the beginning. Um, to There are always times where you think, well, I don't absolutely love this event or I don't I'm not super super passionate but it's it's important to really think about it holistically so am I really good at it am I going to be able to excel at it so much so that I'm going to be asked to come back and do it again am I going to be recommended to someone else is it going to lead me to other jobs and if I I always think if I love something if I feel passionate about it then it's not going to feel like work. Um, but kind of linking into one of the others is what you can be paid for because we we all have to work, we all need money to survive and as much as, yes, it is amazing to be able to work um, in doing something that you love and something that you're good at and something that makes a positive impact in the world. But if you cannot be paid for it then, or, or it's limited, limited then, that is definitely something to consider as well. So I love this diagram. I think it's really important. We spend so much time working that I think it's so important to do something that you absolutely love and want to wake up in the morning and do it and struggle to close your laptop in the evening or struggle to walk away at the end of the day. So pros and cons, um, because I always like to see it from both sides. So as much as yes, there are negatives, there are so many perks and so many pros to being self-employed. Personally, I do love having the flexibility uh, and the autonomy. It's something that I briefly touched upon earlier, but it sometimes can take time to get to a point where you have that flexibility. Um, and it's definitely a long game. I think the first few years of freelancing, much like other careers as well, you're always going to be yeah figuring things out um yeah seeing what works for you seeing what doesn't but it really can come with a certain amount of flexibility if you're mindful of that and put in the yeah the thought and consideration um I always try and think as well over the course of a year how does it look when am I going to be really busy well for me I always know that summer is really busy Christmas is usually very busy unfortunately um but I know that there's usually a bit of a dip around about January, February can be quite quiet months. Uh, September, well, September is usually quite busy, but um, October, November can be quiet as well. So I always try to work my holidays in around my clients and my contracts. So um, I do love to take time off. I do love traveling and I think it's so important as well. I think we get so tied up in our work, in our job, in our clients in what we're trying to do that we can forget sometimes to switch off and, and it really is a long game. So yes, there, there are lots of um, perks and especially now with remote working, something that even before COVID, um, I don't think I'd ever even worked online and now I run a business that is completely online and everything we do can be done remotely. So 
that's also something that I absolutely love about being self-employed. Um, the second one being working with clients that you love and organizations that you choose to work with. So something that I'm very passionate about is, yeah, working with great clients, working with people I enjoy working with, because for me, that then doesn't feel so much like work. It feels more like something I enjoy and time flies when you're having fun. So I try my best to um, use my moral compass to dictate the jobs and the roles that I want to work on um and yeah that's something that I think is very close to my heart and it is one of the absolute best perks of sort of picking and choosing your clients is that you don't have to work for people you don't want to work for if their values don't align with mine ultimately it's never going to work I don't want to support I don't want to fund and and lean in with projects that ultimately uh, are very fundamentally against some of the things that I feel strongly about so that is definitely a huge perk for me um one of the things that I absolutely always love as well is learning new things um just learning doing new things working with different teams um I think versatility is something that I will always say I love being versatile I love learning how different teams do different things. I love seeing new systems, new methods, new frameworks and 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 just constantly learning. If I'm not learning, then I, I tend to get bored quite quickly. So for me, freelance works really well where I can jump into different projects. I'm always more enthusiastic about a project at the beginning. And then I think when I find my feet and I get really comfortable, that's when my interest levels start dropping. And that's not the same for everyone, but my worst nightmare would be working for one company for 20 years. I think for me, that that is my idea of hell. I think, I, or not, maybe not one company, but in one role. And yeah, I, I love meeting new people, seeing new things, traveling to new places, seeing new venues, new clients, new projects. Um, so that for me is a huge perk of course there are some cons as well so there's a lot of uncertainty around being self-employed uh, I definitely I thrive on on that it's not for everyone um I love challenge I love being challenged so for me the uncertainty is opportunity um and probably worth saying as well some of the times I've been the most terrified about thinking well I have no work in my diary right now and I think we tend to get a bit of um a rose tinted view when we're on LinkedIn and things like that and people saying oh I'm fully booked up for the next nine months and you're sat and you look at your diary and you think well I've got one gig and they're paying me 300 quid and that is the only money I have in the bank for this month and it, it can be terrifying but I always say that some of the best opportunities can be last minute. And I think sometimes where I've landed an incredible role, it's because potentially maybe someone else had dropped out last minute because they're just amazing at their job and they got something bigger and better come through the door. So I have landed some of my best jobs being last minute. I think one of them in particular was the one that I did. I went and worked on a government forum in Abu Dhabi and they rung me I think it was on the I saw a Facebook post on the Monday I emailed them they got back to me on Tuesday I did the it sounds like a Craig David song but I did the interview on Wednesday and they said can you be on a plane on Friday it was that soon and I think that opportunity might not have would I have been the first pick if 10 people had applied for the job and we'd gone through the traditional process probably not because there probably would have been people with more experience but at the time I was so so grateful for that opportunity because I learned so much and it really was an incredible role you know the pay was really good so I was yeah over the moon and it just it aligned so well I was so so grateful for that opportunity so um you just never know sometimes things can come really last minute and they're the best ones um something that I definitely speak about a lot is that uh, you do end up working hard at longer hours and the misconception again can be around you get to work less as freelance but because you're always looking for those the next opportunity 
and you do need to do a little bit more to familiarize yourself with the system or the team or the company you will end up taking longer to do things uh, and, and therefore you do sort of end up working harder longer it's inevitable really I think it, it's um freelancing is not for people who and and it's totally fine I don't like the hustle culture I think people should work what they want to work um that you know it if you want to take a month off, then take a month off. If you like working seven hours a day and closing your laptop at 5 p.m. and going to the gym, then do so. If you like working and you love your job and you're passionate and you're happy to work a 12 hour day in the office, then do it. I think it's just knowing yourself, knowing what works and looking at things a bit more holistically and saying, well, this project, yes, it is going to be very hard work. It's going to be long hours, but they're paying me a very big, decent chunk of money. So therefore, this time, yes, I am going to work a little bit harder than I would, but I know I'm going to treat myself and take a week off and close my laptop and ignore all my emails for a week. Uh, I think I said that one earlier. You don't have one boss, you have multiple. So this is something that I also think is really important to highlight because there is a cost to freelancing. Um, and I think sometimes people will see a day rate for a freelancer and say and this is something as well that is really it's a really tricky question because there's um I think I remember I worked for a company once and well I remember very vividly they said don't tell the full-time person in the team how much we're paying you I'm very good by this this was a a last minute opportunity and I wasn't overly enthused about the pay in the first place and I thought well you're saying that and the the rate was really low it was probably one of the lowest day rates that I'd worked on that kind of project before and they said you know don't tell the full-time people and I think that it, it was interesting but the one thing that I would say so when you I'm just going to zoom in if, in case you can't see it well but when you're setting your day rate as self-employed you need to think about do you rent an office space? Do you have a website to showcase your work? You have to buy your own laptop probably every couple of years. That's what a thousand could be up to two thousand pounds. Phone uh, contracts, um, Wi-Fi, public liability insurance, income protection, business account fees, uh, an accountant if uh, not necessary but recommended, uh, accounting software software subscriptions um, such as Canva or, or anything you use like that, memberships, uh, attending events, just getting there in the first place, train tickets, uh, putting away for a pension and putting away for a holiday fund. So those are all of the fun things that um, do have to be taken into consideration and that can cost, um, you know, depending on where you're at and what you use and, and the tools that you need but uh, tools is another one that I haven't even put in there but yeah those are all things to take into consideration so when someone some of my friends who don't work in events you know I'm pretty open about pay I always like to have those conversations I think if I hadn't had those conversations with people a little bit earlier on in my career I wouldn't have known you know the the sort of scope of how much you can be paid as self-employed so it's really important to have those conversations but um if I was to say to a friend who doesn't work in the events industry well you know I'm on a say 250 pounds a day or 300 pounds a day and they'd say that's huge amounts of money you're rich you're boring but the reality is they they don't see all of those sort of hidden costs I have to pay taxes on that and yeah it just goes on and on really so as much as sometimes the day rates can seem very appealing I will always caution around digging a little bit deeper and looking at the costs affiliated to it. So another example would be um, I'm in discussions for a, a huge uh, sports event that's taking place next summer, this summer. Um, and yeah, so the, they sent me an offer um, and I made sure to dig a little bit deeper and um, they sort of gave me a pro rata rate. So that's like what it would be for a monthly um monthly fee and I remember sort of digging and saying well 
Um, is the, the travel to the site covered? How far is the hotel from the site? Um, how many days do you expect me to work? I know it's very hard to say, and it, it's a fine line between not wanting to come across as lazy and sort of, or, or picky or ungrateful for what appears to be a very healthy uh, rate. It's really important to dig a little bit deeper and say, well, yeah, that's the rate. It seems good, but what about all these other little questions around it? Because sometimes that can add up. Um, and yeah, something I try and think about as well is if, say, it's a, a uh, an office day and it's seven to eight hours, nine hours, it's going to be very different to a day on site in the lead up to a huge event where I know that I'm going to be working 12, 13, maybe longer days. So what I'll always try and do is work it out hourly. So I'll take the um, the rate and then divide it by the number of hours. And, and that's often the best way to get a, a comparison point. So you're not comparing apples um, uh, like comparing apples with apples so the boring stuff <laughs> there is a lot of boring stuff affiliated with freelancing being self-employed running a business um all the fun stuff that you don't have to think about when you have an employer and a traditional um full-time job so registering as self-employed it is very straightforward from having lived in france and spain and freelance in france and spain it is so much more simple in the UK. I wouldn't let that put you off. I think a misconception is very often that it's complicated. It, it takes a lot of time. It's stressful. But I really, really would say don't. If that is what's pissing you off, it's just the registering part and the doing your own taxes, then don't let that put you off. It is very straightforward. Um, there are videos you can watch on YouTube you can literally ring HMRC that I don't know if anyone's ever lived internationally or has had similar experiences but in France they, they you can't even find a number to ring someone who works in the tax office that they, they don't even it's very complicated there are lots of little loopholes and exceptions and I, I recommend traveling but I don't necessarily recommend um, registering a self-employed or setting up a business in France it's an absolute nightmare um but that's a whole other cast of fish so um you will have to issue your own invoices you will um but again it's very straightforward you can find templates online if you use an accounting software it's even easier and I'll talk a little bit about some of the tools that I use a bit later on in the presentation um juggling lots of different projects uh it's very hard to get things to align perfectly so there's a lot of juggling calls juggling dates uh holidays projects clients uh, again around invoicing chasing clients which I do really recommend using I use zero I've, I've heard mixed things about QuickBooks some people say it's really good some people say it's a nightmare but I think if you're just self-employed then either or or any other um, software will be very useful because then it avoids the whole awkward part of emailing hey I just want to check in about that payment that I was due last month uh, that is now like a month overdue. So it's really nice to just have the accounting software because it sends automated emails and you can select it as well. So you can go in and change it. I think the default is like the day after uh, a week later, but I've set it to I think like three, four, just like almost every other day when, it, you know, then it's just really like really easy to um chase clients without having to do the chasing yourself it's all automated um doing your own tax returns again I really strongly recommend getting an accountant the first year because then it can really set you up in a good place and I would always say if you um want to get an accountant to do your taxes then you can ask them to show you how and just say look i I want to be able to do it myself next year. Um, can you just talk me through the process? Um, but I would say it's very straightforward. Again, from having done it in France, I, it, it's as simple as just entering how much money you've earned and then it will tell you how much you need to pay in taxes. Um, again, I'll give a couple of uh, tools a bit further on, but keep a record, anything that you can claim back. So in the UK, we're very fortunate in in that sense that you don't pay tax on the first £10,000. So 
anything you can keep as expenses will also lower your tax bill so anything like if I'm away from home and again you can find all of this on the HMRC website there are YouTube videos that you can watch but it's a lot of common sense really so any cost affiliated to doing your job you can put through as a business cost so if I drive to an event I'll log the mileage if I buy a pair of safety boots that's a business expense I'm not going to wear safety boots to like go have a coffee with my gran so anything away from home as well so say you're on site for a month and you have to do your washing that and you pay a laundrette that is a business expense um if you're yeah buying food away from home the only times I don't keep the receipts is if I just go and work from a cafe in my hometown that that's something that I wouldn't really do but there's no black it, it's a bit of a gray area it's not a black or white it, it will do, be dependent on your project and your expenses so probably should have started with this but just, just defining self-employment so uh, I've just taken this from I think the Gov website which is it's important because I think especially in the events industry there are lots of people who I'll come on to it in a sec, but uh, do sort of permalancing. And there are a couple of companies that take advantage a little bit um, or that don't really use freelancers in the right way. So you're self-employed if you run your business for yourself, take responsibility for its success or failure, have several clients at the same time. You have a bit of flexibility in the way you work. Uh, your role is not fundamental to the running of the business. So it means that you could hire someone else to do your job. So you're replaceable. Um, you provide your own equipment. So if you use tools, if you work on site and you have to bring your own um, yeah, tools to do your job, whether it's your laptop, things like that. Um, responsible for finishing work in your own time and you charge an agreed fix upon price for your work. So that could be a day rate or a project rate. So I didn't actually do a slide about permalancing, but it's a, a term I came across which is an interesting one because there are a few people that I know that have sort of done permalancing which is where you are supposed to be freelance but you're supposed to be self-employed but you actually only work for one client so a, an easy way to distinguish between uh, self-employed and not self-employed is you have multiple clients it's that straightforward is if you have more than one client and you work on different projects at different times then you're self-employed if you have one client and they are paying you as self-employed, but you don't work for anyone else, don't have any intention of ever doing so, then that is technically not legal. It's a, Again, it's a bit of a grey area, but another grey area. Uh, just had to mention it because it's something that you can't really talk about. Um, well, not talk about when talking about being self-employed is IR35. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it because it's a very complex um scheme that's been put in place only recently um so I'm not even going to talk about it but I would just say be mindful of it um it's something you see pop up in job descriptions sometimes so um something to be mindful of and this is where an accountant will also be very valuable so if you have questions and um it can come up for longer projects it's something that the government have put in place to um try and limit uh, sort of permalancing um and it mainly started in the construction industry but um something to be aware of yeah so freelancing is not permalancing uh, and be careful about this so a couple of tips uh, just some little um, nuggets here make a CRM keep a record of everything don't um, and do it from day one I started doing it in a couple of yeah a couple of years ago so maybe like halfway through um, being self-employed and it was a tip that my mentor gave me and probably one of the best tips is that um, you need to just keep track of everything uh, and I'll, I'll show you an example in a moment ask for help don't be afraid to reach out um, I think there are lots of really supportive people in this industry um, now we is a wonderful safe space if you're a woman or you identify as female you can go in our Facebook group you can also post anonymously if you're you don't want people to know who you are or what you're talking about um get an accountant if you can I, I really think that the stress that you save yourself uh, it, it's worth it it doesn't cost millions it is an expense yes but it's also 
peace of mind it's time saved you you won't have the same sort of things to unpick if you use an accountant you know this all going to be dealt with properly and plan 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 it's all about planning proper planning um prevents poor performance is something that I always try to go by and I think by nature people that work in events are quite uh, forward thinking so uh, that should be sort of second nature anyway but yeah try and plan the year think about what can be done always think ahead try and think of what clients are out there what opportunities are, are available and um, try and get something on paper um, one of my favorite subjects to talk about um, something that I've mention a lot is personal branding it, it is hard to talk about being self-employed in the industry without talking about personal brand um so I always define it as how people talk about you when you're not in the room so it, it's uh it's intangible and, and it looks very different for different people what's worked for me might not work for you and what's worked for someone else will probably not work for me it's just about being authentic being yourself um and honing in on those defining characteristics that distinguish you from other people. So if you are organization queen or if you are fix at any problem kind of person, just lean in on what you're naturally good at. What is it that people will remember you for when that situation comes up where you've got a really big tech project and you think I really need someone who understands tech and he's very savvy in that sense who am I going to call or if it's health and safety you know you're going to want to work with someone who's responsible and has their you know has everything so it's just always thinking about what is it that makes you you how can you showcase that um and how do you lean in on that to land um jobs because now from seeing it from the other side so now with my business I end up working with lots of freelancers and I try it when the opportunity comes up a client will send me a message and say we need someone who can work um like food and beverage at an upcoming conference and I'm thinking okay who do I know who's really savvy with logistics who is great with clients who has a keen eye for detail and all of those traits and attributes I'm like oh I need that person so that's the person that I'll call um and it very much is about being top of mind when that question comes about so when the client rings me and says that we need someone to do this by building a presence on these different platforms like is it LinkedIn is it Instagram is it Facebook is it like I think I meant more like Facebook groups uh is it a website how do you remain relevant and remain top of mind um and how do you stay in people's minds so much like a business um I don't know take a, a product for for instance or like a service like um I don't know a car mechanic if your car breaks down what where are you going to see those touch points that's going to make you think oh I know a good mechanic that are trustworthy because you're going to want someone who you can trust it's how do you keep up to date so the more times you see the name the more times you see the face if someone it's all about touch points and this is sort of the the basic fundamentals of marketing really is I've, I've seen that person who came to mind uh, for the catering role I've seen them uh, at a networking event recently I follow them on LinkedIn I saw something pop up on their Instagram the other day um, like I mean more a business Instagram so think about those platforms I don't necessarily think everyone has to do well actually I think you definitely don't have to do all of them personally Instagram I've never done a business Instagram I don't really do much for electric cat on Instagram it's a very void um of content but I do love LinkedIn that's my bread and butter and Facebook groups um I never had a, a website for me as a freelancer again I'll, I'll touch on a, a really nifty tool that I have uh, just a little bit um later on but at the beginning it's a lot of sort of throwing things at the wall seeing what works especially if you're new to freelancing um I would say trial and error don't be afraid to just put yourself out there try the try the things see what works uh see what doesn't and then and then just the things that don't work just abandon them because there's no point in trying to push water uphill if it's not working it's not working um you've given it a try and just yeah lean in with what really does work for you uh, one of the things that I love and of course through what I do with Nawi, I'm very very passionate about networking events industry events 
get yourself out there but I think this also works for people that are employed or or self-employed really is get out there get your name out there just people will start to see your face we're a people first industry so just take the opportunity if you've got something near you don't be afraid to throw yourself out there do it just say yes put yourself out there and and just come along to a Nawi networking event people have a great time um in terms of putting together a cv or portfolio can be really hard as self-employed and this is something that one of my favorite tips is and i'll show it a, a little bit later but consider doing a portfolio website so that's a really nice way to because it's so hard cramming on an a4 traditional cv especially when you've been doing it for say 10 years trying to get 10 years worth of experience like looking messy overcrowded and without deleting things because i hate i got to the point with my cv where i just started deleting things i thought well actually that's such a shame because i don't want to delete it i want to show you that i've done all of those different roles because i think there's a lot of value in versatility so consider doing a website nowadays it's very easy um pretty cheap so that's definitely something to consider I spoke about this just now build your linkedin i think more and more people in, in events are using linkedin as a go-to so um yeah definitely use that um and this is one of my favorite tips i use an excel spreadsheet rather than a traditional word document to list all of my different experiences so it looks like this um and as an example um actually by the way i have these all templated uh, so go find me on LinkedIn and drop me a DM if you would like me to send you my template. Um, I am not a gatekeeper. Sharing is caring. So please drop me a DM and just um, write um, a freelance template and I will send you the template. So as you can see, I've listed. I don't go into too much depth about the role because I think everyone knows what a stage manager is or a project manager or producer. So in there, I just put a, a couple of little details. Um, I was at that stage, this was the capacity or just a, a little bit of an outline in there. Tip number two, again, if you want this template, just drop me a DM on LinkedIn um, and just say availability calendar. So I've actually just hidden the row, but you can leave it or you can hide it, whatever works for you is like, I would have put the name of the event. So say I would have put, um, um, I don't know, conference, uh, festival whatever the event was I'd put the name I'd show it I think there's no right or wrong like sometimes I think I don't really want everyone to know where I'm working but then sometimes I think there's a lot of value in them seeing oh wow she's on site you know for three weeks with that show that's a really like so I landed Glastonbury I definitely want to show that that is upcoming and booked in and I think this is really nice because it's a live document I will always send it as a live link so one of the biggest problems in the summer is we all know the demand for work just skyrockets in the summer and then throughout the rest of the year it can be a bit patchy but all of the great people get booked up so quickly over summer that this is just such a great tool to avoid having to do the back and forth of are you available these days can you do that has something changed so because scope of work and and, and budgets and so forth are changing all the time it's really hard to um for people who are contracting freelancers to really know exactly the, the all the information all the dates all the times and everything um i actually have a little second tab as well which is the different roles that i cover so I'm like stage manager or like whatever the roles would be my third um tip would be use a crm so i've just put in some like examples here um but yeah i would just put this is the amount this is what um you know that quote is um you know that's the rate that's the number of days and again if you would like this uh, crm this is one of the templates that people will always ask me about i always put who recommended it so as you can see so much of my work comes through my network so i'd put okay um now i have zero i don't tend to use it as much because we operate as a business it's slightly different but as self-employed if you don't use an account manage, um, as, um, like a Xero or, or QuickBooks, then absolutely make yourself a CRM, treat your self-employment like a business. 
that I always highlight highlighted them in yellow as well. So if someone hadn't paid me, it was highlighted in yellow and then I would unhighlight it when it's paid. So I could see at the glance of an eye who had it paid me and then I'd like move it along. Um, so yeah, meticulously fill in a CRM. Um, yeah, so we're, we're kind of approaching towards the end now. So I'm just going to do a very quick recap and then I would love any questions. Please don't hesitate to send across any questions you have um, and anything that we don't have time to cover today. Again, just drop me a DM. I'll be very happy. I always love helping and supporting other freelancers um, or anyone in the industry. So if you're in doubt, just uh, drop me a quick line. But some absolute key takeaways. Be clear about the roles that you're after. So when I'd send that, um, my availability calendar and CV, I'd send it all packaged in one little folder and I'd say, this is me. This is my experience. These are the roles I do. This is my availability calendar. And doing that has lightened my inbox considerably. Um, and it's just, it's left back and forth. And I think then people know that you're quite serious as well. So be clear about what it is you're after when you're available and don't be afraid to um, put yourself out there. Do a post on LinkedIn and go, these are the roles I do. This is my availability. Who would like to contract me? If in doubt, apply for the role. If you're thinking, I haven't done it before or it's much bigger than one that I've done before, just do it. If in doubt, put yourself forward. Don't be shy. Um, go for it. Um, build your community and build your network. Um, make sure to stay in touch with people. Be part of conversations. Keep up to date, whether it's using some of the platforms that we spoke about earlier or whether it's face to face. Build an online and offline community. Your network is your net worth. And it's very cheesy saying, but I will always I'm a very big believer in that. Make yourself a CRM. It's so valuable. Genuinely, this is the advice that my mentor gave me. And I wish I'd done it from day one. So valuable to look back at the glance of an eye and go, they paid me this amount in 2016. They have not upped their rates uh, in the last eight years. You know, not OK. I won't go back and do that. And you can make little notes as well because you tend to forget. And then when you think back, you know, when you think about the highlights and you tend to forget about the negatives and then you turn up again, you think, I knew this happened last year. They Last year, the same happened as I arrived and they said, yeah, the day will finish at 10 p.m. And then I'm still going at 1 a.m treat freelancing like a business it, it is a business you don't have a boss that you're accountable to and you don't have to send in reports but do it for yourself because ultimately you are your business when you're self-employed and another one of my favorites invest in yourself don't be afraid to um spend money you have to spend money to make money you're not going to have someone who's going to be able to fund courses or training like whether it's first aid whether it's um tickets for plant whether it's um having a mentor whether it's having a coach whether it's taking the time out of your day like today to improve your knowledge or understanding of an area invest in yourself whether it's time whether it's money whether it's qualifications do it it's uh it's very much worth it so thank you all for tuning in today um like i said before i would love to answer any questions you have if you haven't already, uh, please connect with me on LinkedIn. You can scan the QR code there. And if you want to, yeah, drop me an email or drop me a message. I would love to uh, speak further. So thank you so much all for your time. Kat, that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Um, as Kat mentioned, yeah, fire on any, any questions that you have here in the Q&A section. We actually have a couple in here already. So Kat, if you want to click over to the Q&A there, you can see our first question we've got from Ala. Is there a US chapter of NAWI? Oh, don't tempt me. <laughs> <laughs> the committee will kill me. I've No, there is not, I'm afraid. Um, not, not yet, maybe in a few years, but um, we're really trying to focus on getting it right here in the UK before we really commit to um, taking it elsewhere. And also a lot of it is linked to our understanding of the industry. And I think currently, I, no one in the team has an understanding of the events industry in the US and it's a very different market. So we wouldn't want to wouldn't want to make mistakes. So we're going to just do what we do best here first. Fair, fair. And how do people join um, if they do want to join the UK sector? So this is probably something that we should make a lot more clear. Anyone is welcome. Anyone who identifies as female is already a member in our opinion. So sign up to the newsletter, 
Uh, if you're on Facebook, if you're not a Gen Z, go to the Facebook group. If you're a Gen Z, go to TikTok, whatever your platform of choice is, we're probably on it. So we've got all the different platforms. Um, and again, I just can't stress enough, it's totally free. There is no cost. Our networking events are essentially free. You buy a ticket, they normally price between five and seven pounds. And with that, you get your first drink. So it, it's just so we know who's coming. We did used to do them free, but we, we never knew he was going to turn up on the day and then we weren't at capacity. So it's all free. Um, if anything, if you do want to support, uh, please just go and like, engage, share, spread the word, invite your friends to the Facebook group. Um, whatever, however you can support. If it's not financially uh, by making a small donation, then please just go and um, support our social media, sign up to our newsletter because that's worth its weight in gold when we approach, uh, approach sponsors, which is how we fund Nowi. Fantastic. So we've got another question here from Georgia. She's asking, how do you decide on your day rate when you're just starting out as freelance with a wide variety of events experience, but not as freelance? So without either over or underselling yourself? This is the million pound question. So it's one of the questions that we get the most at Nowi. So we wrote um, pay guidelines so you can go onto our website. So I think it's under resources or, or guidelines. It's the far right hand one on our navigation. Um, and we updated it recently because obviously with the cost of living crisis, but I would always try and look at it hourly. So try and break down. So first of all, as a, especially as a new person, minimum wage is absolute minimum and then you're going to want to factor in a, a little bit extra for all of the um uh sort of hidden costs like i mentioned earlier but this is why the crm is so valuable because if you have um a log of all of the previous events that you've done what you've charged then you know where your price point is and just don't be afraid to go in a little bit higher because it gives you a bit of room to negotiate and and always ask for a second opinion. I still, to this day, um, yeah, I will defer to someone who is much more experienced than myself, to someone that I know does that job because yeah, different clients, different jobs, different scope of work. So always, always, always ask for a second opinion, even if you're, you know, or even if the client have suggested the rate and they say the project rate is X, then always, yeah, run it by someone else just to get a second opinion. Yeah, that's a good point. We have another one here from Tracy. She's asking, do you think it's important to have a personalized email address rather than just using Gmail? Well, that's actually a really good one. I personally would say don't do that because what happens is when you create a new email, especially at the very beginning, um, because of the way like Google and like, I don't know how it works, but like because of tech reasons, let's say, um, it often will land in spam, especially at the very beginning. So what I sometimes do if I'm reaching out cold, I have my hello at electriccat.co and then I have my personal, which is so old and it's Catherine Kevin, which is so awkward. No one ever calls me Catherine. Um, but what I'll always do is send it from my personal and then CC the business one in. And I'm sure it's fine now, but we set up the business a year ago, but I would say for the first year or so, or some can just, especially big companies, they'll have like the way their outlook is set up or Gmail, it tends to put things in spam. So I would actually say, if you're the right person for the job, no one's gonna ever say, they're great and they're available. And the, the, the interview went really well, but I don't know that they're, you know, that this is definitely not gonna be a deal breaker. So I'd say don't bother. And it's an extra cost, you can spend that money elsewhere. I suppose once it's a case that you're not still using your first ever email address that probably has some weird name or something. <laughs> I don't use that. There is value in not, I do have a really, really old one, but at least, yeah, do one that is just simple. Or as well, just kind of separate it out. Like quite a lot of people have one, which is like catkevinevents at gmail.com. And then, yeah. Yeah, fair, fair. Um, we have another one in here from Georgia. Um, Georgia's asking, have you ever have a, had a bad freelancing experience? And if so, how did it impact your confidence in future jobs? Oh, I've had loads of bad freelancing experiences that I'd be, anyone would be lying that says that they haven't had bad experiences, especially at the beginning. Um, I was just telling someone yesterday about how, unfortunately for me, now we came from a bad place of having lots of very negative experiences. And I didn't want anyone to have to go through those kind of experiences that I went through when I was first self-employed. I didn't have... I speak about my mentor and my coach, but she, I didn't have that early on in my career. I didn't know many women in the events industry. I didn't know, I knew one woman that ran her own business. That's it. I didn't know who to turn to. I didn't have people I looked up to. 
I definitely didn't have a mentor for the first five years, five, six, seven, six, six years or so. Um, and yes, I've had some terrible experiences, which if I see you at an AWI Network event, I'll tell you all about it because I think you learn so much more from failure. And this is something that I cannot stress enough. Don't be afraid to, you know, those negative experiences enable me to skyrocket my career. And, you know, you learn more from mistakes. And I always say to the team at Electric Cat, you know, I encourage you all to make mistakes because you learn from your mistakes. And as long, you know, at the end of the day, we're not saving lives. Um, yes, there are some things like health and safety that are very important and not to be, you know, sort of just um, willy nilly. Uh, but no, I think don't be afraid to make mistakes. Don't be afraid to take on new roles um, and, and you'll learn from that. Yeah, 100%. Um, another one in here from Kelly. So asking any tips on showcasing your work um, or what to put on your CV when you're under an NDA? Yes, so that's, you, yeah, what I do is I'll put the um, corporate client or I did a, um, I can't talk about it, <laughs> no. um, I did a, um, it was like a private festival for a very, very rich individual in his back garden in the Cotswolds and okay. he brought in like a huge headline of it. It was all super secret because obviously he's very well known. Um, but that is still in my CV. So what I just put is something a bit abstract. I'll just put um, private party and then I can still put, and, and this is what I would always just check. So what I'll do is like write out in my CV how I would write it. Private party, date, role, very brief outline of what I did. So I was the site coordinator. So I put, you know, I helped like with the contractors and the site and this and that. And then I sent it to the client. I said, hey, just double checking. Are you happy for me to put that in? And I think as long as you're not naming names, as long as you're not um, giving away too much detail, like same with budgets, I'll always just be a bit cautious about yeah things like that but if in doubt just run it by your client and then they'll they'll advise fair fair I'm so curious now about <laughs> that uh, um, okay, another question in here from Georgia do you have a separate CV for freelancing experience to general events industry experience or are they both on the same one well I've always been freelance I've never had a full-time job but um I do have two so in my little folder where I put my availability my freelance roles which is like I think I have had it was kind of it was a it was a perma lancer role i was like a project manager during covid for a chalet company in france it was very random um but yeah that was sort of a long term role but it wasn't really perma lancing because i was i did also have other clients so i had other marketing clients so um yes i do have a separate cv and i would send both but funnily enough once or twice people only open one i think it was like attached to an email and then they didn't open both because like just being busy so like maybe it was a negative I think they only saw like the they're like do you actually work in it so I was like yeah read the other CV um so it, it maybe can cause a bit of confusion but I think like in general yes having to especially if you've done a lot of big roles then you you might want to sort of expand on that if you were with a company for a year you're gonna have a bit more to say than if you turned up and you're a stage manager I just got to the point where I was like I, I don't need to explain what a stage manager does it's very clear yeah I suppose I mean they even say when you're just sending a CV you should try to keep it as short as possible like two pages so I suppose it depends on the role you're going for you just want to keep it as relevant to what they're looking for as possible yeah I see the CV as getting at the interview I'm that's where someone's going to make it if you can land the interview you can sell yourself well I, I I hope like that's that's really the opportunity me personally I'm I'm not very good with like I'm more of a people person than a words person so I can talk and I will sell myself and I have great like success rates in interviews but if I was to just have to write a cover letter I think I'd probably fail quite miserably at that I'm just not very good with um I think the cover is everyone's least favorite part of job hunting yes <laughs> <laughs> um okay question here from Tracy I have events experience working within hotels but also within a couple of agencies for whatever reason, I'm finding that the hotel experience is looked upon negatively. Any thoughts about why that might be the case? Interesting. No idea. I've never worked hotel side. Um, and you've no. never even heard from within the industry yourself people speaking negatively about hotel side? No, um, but I would suggest maybe like doing a little uh, post in Nawi if you identify as female, go into the Nawi group because um, it could be that there are lots of people with a lot more experience than me who would be able to advise. But um, no, I've not heard that before. 
Yeah, that's a good idea. And I suppose with anything like this, find a community that's, you know, along those lines and just ask them and get their opinions on it. Mm. Um, last question here for the moment. If anyone has any more, feel free to pop them in now while we're still chatting. Um, we will obviously have to go off in a moment though. But from Daisy, we have, when making a portfolio website, how do you portray the event you worked on without claiming ownership of it? Because obviously that belongs with the client. I wouldn't worry. I, I, I personally, maybe I, I don't worry enough, but I would just put a photo of the event. It, it could be one of yours that you've taken on your phone or like just grab one from their website. I don't think people worry too much about that. As long as you're just clear about the roles and responsibilities. So as long as you don't claim, you know, I produced the whole show, as long as you're quite clear um my role was a stage manager at this stage which was the second biggest stage uh, and I worked there for three days and it's so I think once you get into the routine as well it's so easy for me the first thing I do when I get home after an event is I would fill in my like freelancing CV I'd issue the invoice and then just update if you've got a website portfolio you've got it all templated so you would go duplicate the page update the photo you've got five lines where it's like my role the dates my involvement, two lines of responsibilities, boom. And it, people say, oh, but I don't have time. And you have, you if if you do want to do this seriously, you need to just make the time. And the more you do it, the faster it becomes. Um, and and as you're doing it as you go along, that saves time as well, as opposed to having to do it in bulk at a later date. Exactly. And it's so funny. I've just looked in one of the comments and um, someone's, uh, uh, Karina has written, I wish I'd known when I started. And funny enough, one of the talks that I do, that I did at um, IMAX, and I think I did it again Friday at, at Production Futures, which is a great event to check out, uh, was exactly that. I call it things I wish I knew when I started because I could write a book. Of, I've, I've done it all the hard way, which I've learned so much from it and wouldn't do it any other way. But there are, the, yeah. No one, no one gives you a manual when you start out. It's uh, you do have to navigate quite a lot, and um, because this is you kind of giving a bit of a manual. <laughs> yeah, well, that's why I love what I do. honestly it, for me like taking the time out of the day to yeah share some. And I, I would never claim to be the most experienced person. I learn every single day, but I really, really love helping other people. Um, and I'm very, I'm very grateful that lots of people have helped me. And I do believe that it swings and roundabouts and you get out what you put in. I don't really believe in like weird stuff, but I do believe in um, like, yes, what comes around goes around and, and it might not be direct, but the more you help people, then I always think, yeah, it, it comes around. Yeah, I would 100% agree with that too. We've got one more question here and then we'll probably have to leave off because it's gone too and I know people will have to drop off. Um, so Theo is asking, I'm a health and safety professional in facilities management industry and recently considering safety in the events industry. Do you think it's worth the switch? I don't know anything about facilities management, but um, it doesn't sound as fun as of events. But then again, I might be mistaken. <laughs> I would say if you... Um, like working in a fast paced environment, if you're like a go getter, if you like traveling, if you are happy to, yeah, and, and would enjoy traveling around the UK, potentially even other countries. And it's something that if you like events and people, you're probably going to, um, yeah, get and, and yeah, just try it. It's uh, there are lots of opportunities. I'd say now is a good time to start thinking about it if you do want to make the switch because over the summer is when you're going to get a shed load of work. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, now's the time fantastic well Kat thank you so much that was a really really great presentation it's been absolutely fantastic having you here and thanks everyone also for joining um I'll have the recording of this up on our YouTube page this Friday so if anyone had to drop off at any stage or wants to share it with one of their friends you'll be able to access it that way brilliant so have a great rest of your day thanks again for joining us thanks so much bye cheers bye